Uh, so welcome to IE Stories, Using Local Narratives in K-12 Instruction. We're really excited for you to come to this, like, uh, this, this little intimate workshop that we're putting on. We really want to share some resources and um, some, some terrific content knowledge with you for, over the, the next uh, 60 minutes. Um, and we also are going to talk about a really exciting opportunity that uh, some of you may be interested in. Um, so uh, before we get into that, uh, you'll find the agenda um, in your in your um, in the chat. But just to give give you a sense of what the agenda looks like, so when you click on this agenda, you should be able to. Um, and if somebody could put that in the chat, you should be able to click here to sign in. And we're asking that you um, that you do sign in. It really helps us as um, members of a partially taxpayer funded project to show that we are having some impact, no matter how small or large it is. So if you could sign in, that would be great. Uh, and we also have um, slides that you could follow along with, a, a folder for resources, and then the agenda and contact information here at the bottom uh, for you. Okay. So um, let's go ahead and jump into this. Thank you all for introducing yourselves. We're gonna go ahead and introduce ourselves in a second, but first we're gonna do some land acknowledgements. So for that, I'm gonna pass the mic to uh, my colleague, Michelle. Okay, well, I'm not gonna read through all of these to you, but we do wanna acknowledge uh, that we are on the ancestral and current homeland of many indigenous peoples in California. Um, so we've included the land acknowledgements for our separate universities, which encompass a good chunk of Southern California, which is pretty nice. But there are all many groups that aren't included within this that you know also um, worked in and around and lived in and around the regions that we cover. So um, CSUSB, we are on Serrano land, but we also have neighbors with the uh, Kuia and the Gabrielino Tongva, um, and then to the south, the um, Lucinio, um, UCLA, we have the Gabrielino Tongva people um, really uh, heavily represented um, in that land acknowledgement and at UCR, um, uh, again, another university that's pretty solidly within uh, Kauia territory, extending all the way out into the desert, but also with some um, Lucinio presence and Serrano uh, uh, as well as um, Chimwevi and many other groups in the region. And then at University of Redlands also being in that really central piece of the Inland Empire, we have um, the Serrano and, and Kuya as well. Um, so we just want to you know, acknowledge the indigenous people in our region and, and the land that we are currently on that continues to be their land. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, as Amparo uh, mentioned, the um, the there's going to be a link that you can find right now in your PowerPoint. It was also going to be put in the chat. One of um, a terrific teacher from from uh, this community, Amanda Sandoval, um, created this great activity that sort of goes beyond uh, just making a, a land acknowledgement. It gives students a chance to build their own land acknowledgement to use that uh, great website we shared in the chat as a means to find what uh, indigenous land they live on. So we really recommend that um, that activity and you'll see that uh, the template there for y'all to use if you want. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, give you some overview. If you have any messages um, in the chat, you could direct them towards somebody who's not speaking. So if you're directing messages at me, you're just gonna have to give me a few minutes to get back to you um, as I'm presenting. So I, I just want to give some context. What, how do we get here? How do we get to IE stories? Well, this actually starts back in 2020, uh, year of the pandemic. Um, we uh, applied for a grant with, I'm sorry, my daughter's in here. Uh, we applied for a grant with, um, with some partners that we had from the San Bernardino County Superintendent of Schools and also uh, Michelle Lormore from Cal State San Bernardino. This is a Library of Congress uh, uh, grant and uh, we were able to secure it and we called this, uh, this project Localizing the Narrative. And we did a series of workshops, you'll see the flyer up there. Um, and our, our teacher leader for that was Liz Ramos who uh, may or may not be here. 
she did a really terrific job as well. Um, and uh, we, we picked up that and we continue to offer this series in the second year of the program in 2021. That time we wanted to extend out to the Riverside area, Riverside County. So we partnered with uh, Don Powell in the Riverside County Office of Education. Don's here, he's one of the family. So uh, we're glad to see him here. And also Michelle, that longtime family member was part of that team as well. And uh, we, we uh, had a teacher leader who was also dynamic named Vanessa Herrera who shared some of her resources during that time. So the, the, the work produced so much content, it produced so many resources and it produced um, a sort of groundswell of requests for more of this. Um, and particular, we were, we were getting uh, requests for like lessons and, and things that teachers can just plug into their classrooms to localize their, their courses. And so we um, got back together. We had this great opportunity presented to us by not just Michelle, but Jennifer Tilton, uh, Professor Tilton from the University of Redlands and Kathy Judas, uh, Professor Judas from the University of uh, uh, UC Riverside, who have been doing some amazing work um, with the California State Parks and Citrus uh, Parks and collecting all kinds of really amazing local stories, counter narratives, interviews, oral histories, photos, just amazing things from the archive. And we want to talk a little bit about all of these resources and talk about, uh, as we wrap up, how we could uh, make those or turn those into lesson plans for students in our community. Um, so yeah, that's just a little bit of context for you all. As I mentioned, this current project is a collaboration of all of these uh, organizations. Um, uh, Jen or Kathy, if you want to talk a little bit about the Relevancy and History Project, feel free to. Otherwise, I can just show this as uh, all the various partners here. I'm also <laughs> sick, so I'm sorry if my voice uh, if it's hard to hear. Your voice is going in and out, so I'm just going to move this forward. I'm actually going to just do a quick call out. I wanted to call out um, Audrey Meyer, who's here, who has been um, a partner in the crime of doing a lot of historical work. <laughs> um, and she is here and she was involved since 2016 with the Relevancy and History Project partnership between UCR and California State Parks. And now she is um, the co-director of the People's History of the IE Digital Archive. So I'm really glad she's able to be here. Shout out. Yeah. Big shout out. Thank you so much, Audrey, for all your hard work. Okay, so some introductions. I'm gonna go first. <laughs> my voice is leaving. Uh, my name's Danny uh, Diaz. I am the current director of the UCLA History Geography Project. Before that, I was a uh, high school teacher for, uh, for 12 years and I was a middle school teacher for one year. And I taught in uh, Southern California, Boyle Heights and in, um, in Pico Rivera, California. And I've been doing this work for eight years and um, I'm, I'm really excited to be working on local history, especially in a community that's so near and dear to me. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and pass it. We'll just go down the line. Uh, Cindy, you wanna go ahead and, and say hi to everyone? Sorry, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Cindy Mata, Associate Director. I'm excited to be learning alongside you. I think the rest of the team did all of the heavy lifting. So I am just here as a learner alongside y'all. So, awesome. Ems? I'm Amparo Chavez Gonzalez, and I'm excited. Um, <clears throat> we have some wonderful materials today, and hopefully uh, lots of you will continue to join us and uh, work with us on this project. Oh, I've been an educator for 32 years. I'm, I'm the old timer on the, uh, in the group <laughs> from UCLA. Um, Mark? Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Anthony. Um, I'm the program manager for the UCLA History Geography Project. I'm really happy to be here and learning alongside um, a history that I was never introduced to, um, but also here to help with anyone who might have tech issues. So if you have any issues or need help, uh, feel free to just message me in the chat. Um, and then I can pass it to Kathy, I believe. Hi, I'm Kathy Gudis. I'm a professor of history at UC Riverside, and I direct the public history program there for people who want to work in archives, museums, preservation. Um, and I have um, a, a secret in my background, which is that I taught for a brief bit at Hollenbeck Junior High School long ago. Um, and so I'll just, uh, I'll leave it at that. I've been around the block a few times. Thanks. <laughs> 
you learn something new. How about you, Jennifer? You want to introduce yourself? Say hello. Yeah, sure. So I am a professor of race and ethnic studies at University of Redlands. Um, I work with Kathy um, and Audrey on the people's history of the IE project and do a lot of mapping and working also with the bridges that carried us over archive of Black history. And I'm Michelle Lorimer. I'm a historian at Cal State San Bernardino. I work a lot with our pre-credential history students who are planning to be teachers and do a lot of community work with Jen and Kathy as well. Great, thank you so much. Here's our agenda. Amparo, I'm gonna pass it to you, uh, I believe. Yeah, you are. <clears throat> Let's put that uh, voice to rest. Uh, hello, everyone. As you can see, this is our agenda. You also have it in the uh, link in your agenda. We're going to be moving quickly. Um, so I, ahead of time, I apologize to you. I'm sort of the, the person on the team that shortens activities to adjust for time. So if I rush you, I apologize. Uh, this is a, a, a quencher to get you to come back for another time. So I'm glad you're here. And we're going to start moving along with the agenda. If you can go to the next slide. Oops. So we're going to be doing an inclusion. And what we'd like you to do is uh, Mark is going to put um, three of you in a breakout room. Please remember your breakout room number if you can. You're going to have some time to look at some an image based on your breakout room. And then there's going to be some questions attached to it. So please feel free to discuss and document your conversations. We're going to give you six minutes to take a look and if Danny if you could go to the next slide real quick so people can see what it looks like so our inquiry question for this um, particular workshop is to think about why do people choose to live and work in the Inland Empire and if you could go back to the previous slide and so each one of you will be looking at an image or a source that give you some ideas of why people move to the IE and why we do this is because historians use inquiry questions to find information and to answer questions about historical significance in our communities and in the world and so we want to start modeling for you and for you to think about how do we use inquiry questions in the classroom and so this is an inclusion activity to help you start thinking about that and thinking about how we do okay so when you get to your breakout room look at your <clears throat> powerpoint and then you want to answer those questions with your uh, breakout room partners. I have that it's 448 at 454. We will stop the breakout rooms and then come back for a short debrief. OK, so Mark, if you can open up breakout rooms. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. So I was hoping that maybe one or two of you if you haven't looked at the other images, feel free to do so. But I was wondering if any of you um, would want to share what narratives about why people choose to live and work in the IE emerge for you. Are these similar or different from those that are found in your uh, curricular materials right now? And how do you think students will react to this and these images and these uh, materials? If we could get one person um, to share, that would be great. Please unmute and share. Whoever would love to do it. I keep get, becoming uh, mute without, it's, it just happens. <laughs> but anyway, um, the it varies by how, far back we go because you had the ranchos are are very much a part of why people came uh during a, a you know in the early period uh and then gradually because uh as Mexico was needing to pull back uh after the war in the, you know the uh 19th century then people came for cattle and other other things uh here so uh the uh, citrus industry came uh, uh well actually it's it's fairly early too but not that early but uh 
some of the very first uh, citrus was at the missions uh, in, in this Southern California region. So uh, it varies by, by what are the needs of the society and uh, what, what uh, uh, are the, the benefits of the area? What, what are the things that can be offered here? And it was considerably fertile land and uh, uh, it was uh, very healthful. And so people <clears throat> would move from the East to come out here and, and uh, uh, try to maintain a, a higher level of, of life uh, physically, because uh, there, there was so much problem with tuberculosis and those kinds of things. But there are lots of places to go and, and visit in uh, Southern California that have, uh, you know, a, a period of time when it was during a particular era. And that era gives you the story to put together in history. And it and in the modern era, it's a lot of times it's something that was part of the whole political process and uh, became very significant because of that. Thank and you. And then also Martin. housing was cheaper when it when it got to be after World War II, cheaper out here than it was in Long Beach and other places. Thank you. Um, I did see a, a, a comment um, from Joanne, right? So how do we think about what narratives emerge in these in these images specifically, right? So you see different groups and you start to wonder why were people moving? Who were these images taken for? Right. Uh, in one of the uh, rooms that I was in, there was a conversation about. So was this picture taken to recruit more Korean um, workers or was it taken to send back a picture to the family? Right. And say, hey, look, we're we're good. We're fine. Look, we have work and and we're all together. Right. So who were these pictures images taken for? What were they documenting for us? I know one image that you guys had. It was a picture on the back. It had. Um, something written by a young woman to her family, right? She says, mom, here's a picture of us working at the packing factory, right? So what was what was she trying to do, right? To let mom know, look, I have a job, I'm okay. There's other women here. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can think about um, these. And I love the comment about like, so would that get students to think about why did my family come to the IE? What what encouraged them to come? What pulled them? What pushed them away from where they were? And how is my family connected to the, the history of California, but also of the nation? So those are all what ways for you to start thinking about these materials. And so now I am going to move it along here. Oh, Alexander, you were going to make a comment. Sorry about that. Oh, oh yeah, I can't much add. I can't add much more to what Dr. Hill just said. But um, I just wanted to mention that I guess it also would be great for students to hear from their own personal, their teachers' family experience. I have two grandmas and one grandpa that worked at the packing house here in um, Riverside. And so when I look at images like this and everything from the hairstyle that I'm seeing to um, just the way that the men look, I mean, I can't help but think of my own grandparents. And I think it'd be really cool to have uh, my, our students see that our family worked there and that it's uh, very personal to us. And when they see the passion in us, that it would hopefully get them to think about how their parents possibly work here. Just, just a thought as well, too. So if we can personalize it, maybe they might also um, personalize it as well. Thank you so much for that. I, we're going we're gonna to pass it along and, and hopefully you guys will start seeing all those connections because that's what we were going for. So Michelle, pass it on to you. So one of the things that we wanted to examine through this is we're going to be introducing you to such a wide variety of sources and, and really like, I mean, half an hour, you're just going to see tons of stuff. So to frame that analysis and the like visualization of, of uh, potential things that you could use in your classroom, uh, we wanted to just narrow it down by having some framework questions to help guide the analysis that you, or the approach that you may wanna take. So um, we pulled some questions from the framework uh, starting with grade five, where we start US history and then going to grade 11, but they're all kind of building on each other. And you can see the fifth grade questions in eighth grade and you know, similarly on eighth grade questions in, in 11th grade. Um, so 
some of the things that we are thinking about is why people came to the United States at the turn of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. This is when the history in the Inland Empire is really starting to um, include many more voices and people. So that's why we're looking at this period, uh, especially this era of industrialization and how it affected people in their lives, their family, community development, um, examining the ways that that the nation became more connected and how that interconnectedness changed uh, over time in the 1800s, looking at eighth grade. But also then 10th grade, if you're looking at um, global history, there are many ways where the Inland Empire connects to global events. And so we can see migration and immigration in the Inland Empire. And so we can connect to stories of uh, economic change in Mexico, for example, or China, and, and relate that back to why people come to the Inland Empire. At the same time, if we're looking at contemporary society, we can look at globalization and the ways that globalization has changed the Inland Empire, um, especially in the years after NAFTA, for example. Um, and then as we move into 11th grade, we can examine the 20th century and the ways that issues such as education, civil rights, movement, immigration, uh, LGBTQ um, rights, uh, disability rights, um, all these different movements help shift uh, change in people's experiences, but also uh, economic policy changes and social and cultural uh, engagement in broader political and um, social cultural platforms helps raise the voices of uh, marginalized or underrepresented groups over time. So um, there's many places in each grade level where we can fit local history. These are just some examples. If you're teaching a grade that isn't represented on here, I have a huge list of other um, framework questions. So send me a message or just ask and I can send uh, you some more questions that you could use at your grade level. Um, but one thing to note is that when we look at these questions, a lot of the conversation revolves around why did people come to the Inland Empire? And it tends to leave out indigenous people um, who were already here. So one thing to, to keep in mind is how might we adjust or reframe some of these questions to include indigenous people and the ways that they shaped their the land and environment and um, navigated through multiple waves of change in California over um, several centuries, but the ways that they continue to also um, protect their land and fight for sovereignty. Um, so next slide you know, gets us a little bit more into the content. So here are some examples of ways that we can incorporate Native people's experiences touching on what Amparo mentioned about why things are produced and who they're produced for and also what Kathy mentioned about that. Um, I have a few resources here. All of these have, they're all linked. So if you go into the slideshow, you can go through and click and, and look through um, the whole like Riverside Orange recipe book it was produced by Sunkiss as a promotional tool that paired Sunkiss citrus recipes with the history and experiences of sh students at Sherman uh, Indian School, which is really, uh, I mean, kind of fitting for Riverside at the time, but also just a really interesting, you know, source to look through and share with students. I think they get a kick out of it. Um, that represents history of Indigenous people and their experiences in a particular way, specifically through the lens of citrus. Um, but there are many other resources that we can pull from, from readily available sources about Inland Empire history that can give us a more nuanced perspective of Indigenous people's experiences. And so through digitized sources from Sherman Indian Museum, there are these three other examples that show Sherman students working um, at the school farm or working on equipment, or again, another one on the farm, just to kind of keep that agriculture lens uh, together. And then um, Kathy also added a video um, that's in the bottom right corner that you can view um, to, to hear more about some of these experiences from some scholars at, at University of 
um, uh, UCR. So one of the things that we were working to identify is we were brainstorming about ways to present this content to you all and for this series that we're hoping to do is how we would present this just all-inclusive history of the Inland Empire with, with these thousands of sources. And um, we, we narrowed some downs and we narrowed them down in a few ways. So we can do things like address different themes, which you can see uh, illustrated here, or address aspects of this history by different groups or identities. Um, we are leaning more towards the thematic side because then it's more inclusive of many people's perspectives. But um, just to help you frame where you might want to insert some content in, in, in curricula or lessons that you already have developed, these are some of the, the topics that our material focuses pretty heavily on. So um, these are lists of some of those, those repositories uh, that you can find a plethora of sources on the history of people in the Inland Empire. Uh, Sweet and Sour uh, History Project by that's um, led by Kathy Gudis. She's gonna talk about those sources. I'm not gonna get into it much, but they're all linked here. And I really encourage you to start going through these, these sources. Uh, People's History of the Inland Empire is uh, story maps, but also digital archives. We, there's the Bridges That Carry Us Over project that examines black history in the Inland Empire, especially with a lot of oral histories. Uh, the Relevancy and History Project has several five-minute videos that you can easily take and use in your in your classroom and in different lessons that can help bring some local perspective to maybe a national topic that you're looking at. And then we also have a collection of Sanborn maps that the Library of Congress has on their website that's linked here that provide really interesting visual aids for the ways that cities were laid out and how people structured their lives. Um, and how um, cities structured themselves by excluding or including different groups. And then to make larger connections, there's Calisphere, which covers all of California and is a humongous digital repository that includes museums, archives, libraries, all kinds of stuff from across the state where you can make larger connections if that's what you're interested in doing. And there's some national stuff in there too and all kinds of stuff. So, with all of that together, there are, if you include Calisphere, hundreds of thousands of oral histories, images, postcards, newspaper articles, maps, letters, diaries, um, so much stuff. So um, we're going to show you some things over the next several slides, but I'd like you to keep in mind sources that you would like to see or you would like to use. Um, and if there aren't represented, just keep note of that because we'd love to know additionally what you'd like to use in your classroom. Okay, Thanks. I'm all done. Great. Um, thanks so much. And you know, I just want to note that some of those links, which I won't share just for the interest of time, um, go to existing oral histories um, that represent people potentially like um, Alexander, your, your relatives, right? In other words, it's a collection that spans oral histories at different moments in time. Um, and it's focused mostly on working people and um, in some cases on citrus grove managers and owners. It's not just citrus related, it's about experiences in the IE more broadly, um, including people who have lived in the shadow of the I-10 freeway or who were displaced by the freeways. Um, and so what I wanted to do is just share a couple of images that have been really useful to us in bringing together some of the photographic material and other um, ephemeral materials like the citrus crate label that's in the middle bottom with the other documents that um, include oral histories and um, additional materials. Now, some of these are in are linked in the previous slide, right? Um, some of them we've used as part of the Sweet and Sour Citrus site, which has some prepackaged um, existing um, uh, lesson plans. For instance, if you look at this image in the bottom middle, um, you can you know, click onto educational resources under Sweet and Sour Citrus, and you'll see Audrey Myers has produced a visual um, uh, digital means of sort of narrating for us 
the ways in which we might think about the portraits of different people in the groves and what was pictured and what was left out, right? And so in the image at the bottom, what's pictured are wealthy people who are touring through the landscape and there's a mansion in the background. What's left out are all of the signs of the labor and those who would have been encamped as in the upper left-hand image, which is um, an image of a Cahuilla settlement in the 1880s at Spring Rancheria, where native people were um, setting up camp in order to become wage labor. They were pressed into that wage labor because of other resources not available to them um, where they were otherwise circulating or sustaining themselves. They had been displaced, so now they were entering wage labor uh, for many, including the citrus labor. In the middle top image is an image of the first Korean American settlement, organized settlement in the United States. It's called Pachapa Camp, and it was uh, begun in the early 1900s. Um, and if we uh, look at it, through the whole collection of images, you'll be able to see entire sets of lifeways of a group of people who came here at a time when their land was occupied in Korea by um, Japanese, and they came to Riverside, formed a settlement, the first Korea town really, and agitated for independence, developed the thinking around it, and um, worked in the citrus industry among other things. Later decades, of course, that industry became dominated by Latino workers, as you see on the right. So we've tried to put together some of these histories in some short digital essays with the primary sources as are linked at the right. If we can go to the next slide. So that's kind of a snapshot of some of the available resources. And in this slide, we can kind of think about um, other resources for which, for instance, UCLA has done some lesson plans to focus on African Americans and to think about California and localizing the narratives when we consider the fact that though slavery was considered outlaw, it was considered a free state, people did come to California after the American, in the American era, as with Biddy Mason, who came with the Mormon settlement, um, settled in San Bernardino as an enslaved woman, um, and actually won her own freedom with the help of other freed Blacks from Los Angeles. So in other words, San Bernardino's earliest settlements were in part due to enslaved um, laborers who were set there until they were um, moved as the Mormon settlement left. All right, so Biddy Mason is a great story for San Bernardino of someone who accrued great wealth. Other people who came with that, um, with the Mormon settlement stayed who were African American, also as women accrued land and wealth that also was then in, invested in in Riverside. So great stories about, um, you know, this era, civil rights period, and as well as post uh, Civil War period that we can utilize to localize narratives. Can we go to the next slide? Um, we mentioned uh, Sanborn maps as among those resources. The Korean labor story is a really good one because in, in Riverside's East Side, it's a multiracial community that was forged in East Side. Um, not many people realized that the Korean settlement was here. We can see it in this 1908 Sanborn map, um, which marks it out as a Korean settlement. Well, lo and behold, by the 1920s, after the great citrus freeze, where most of the Korean Labor Bureau that's marked here in this ad uh, was sort of shut out of um, business practices, the Japanese American um, laborers had a little bit more of a stronghold on the citrus marker uh, market. And then as Mexicans began to migrate into the region, they also ended and entered the industry. Well, this Korean settlement was replaced a few years later, if we look at the maps, by Japanese settlement. And a few decades after that, after incarceration of Japanese Americans, it becomes labeled Mexican shanties, right? So it's this continuum all the way from China, Chinese patterns, because it was said to have also been the buildings that um, Chinese railroad laborers lived in. So we have this great map to show this and a, a large number of photographs and some other materials related to Pachapa Camp due to research that was done in Korean language that now has been translated. There's also some other lesson plans that are linked here. Can we see the next slide? Um, other elements that I think we, um, you know, kind of are, are looking looking towards are these elements of the Bracero program, that binational agreement between the United States and Mexico during World War II to bring laborers here. By the late 1940s, um, and actually during the wartime years, this really increased. Some 80% uh, of the citrus laborers were Braceros. Yet what we also know is that when the Braceros arrived here, they were oftentimes housed in sites that had been formerly used 
used um, to incarcerate um, people um, as prisons or also as labor camps. And so these are robust stories that we can tell. A student was, um, was just transcribing one of the oral histories um, in the collection that we were citing and said that um, the, narrate, the, the person being interviewed talked about how um, there was a strike among Braceros and, um, and that uh, you know, they talked about the truck carrying the workers who were breaking, breaking the strike was overturned. So we can get really nuanced information. This is a Bracero um, contract that's a great source. Um, Simona Villera on the right married the man to the right of her, um, marking um, an association between different waves of Mexican immigrants that mark its own intergenerational conflicts and contestations. And so there's a story here about that Bracero that's linked and the quotes here, and I'll just move on from here quickly. Next one. Next slide, please. Of course, lots of great examples through both images and accompanying short texts that are part of a people's history of the IE archi digital archive. Um, this photo of the Casablanca neighborhood of Riverside showing the Cinco de Mayo festivities from 1910. 1940s festivities also highlighted the Bracero workers who were brought out holding Mexican and American flags and they were mentioned in the newspaper. So we have clippings to kind of point to that as well. Um, and then on the upper right is African American community building for which we've gotten some good documentation over the past several years. And this shows community building of a structure that was owned by the Colored Mercantile Association, an association of investors of black folks who created a social space on the second floor that ended up being a multiracial um, community building space and where freedom schools, and we'll go to the next slide, um, were also organized when they were trying to agitate for integrated schools, right? Um, we also know through sports and leisure that there were lots of uh, bands that were organized in the 40s and 50s here, segregated social spaces that served them, um, as well as issues around suit suitors in Riverside. Um, it was about a moral problem and where will they go with their outfits on? And in San Bernardino, there was actually a race riot that was aligned with that in Los Angeles. I love the images of the baseball teams. This is the Casablanca women's baseball team on the right. We'll move to the next one. Next slide, thanks. Um, we can see elements of environment injustice in a variety of ways here. It's about pesticide use, the next slide. And we can also bridge some connections from the citrus industry of the past to the way in which um, areas like Colton, Ontario, San Bernardino, um, Rialto are dominated by the logistics warehouses today and the ways in which that has taken over land that was once citrus and also vineyards and the way that the nature of the jobs in some ways is, is parallel. So we can point to this with, with a number of resources that we have sort of prepackaged and ready for you to use. If you're interested, this is a short video. Um, and then let's go to the next slide. Thanks. And then um, also to just point towards lots to do with civil rights and activism in terms of localizing. We don't need to spend our time on school desegregation movements in the South, those, though, though those are, of course, really important civil rights stories. If we wish we can focus on elements in the region, these are both from Riverside, both in terms of a segregated pool at Fairmount Park. Um, Lincoln Park Pool in Eastside was built in order to accommodate a lawsuit from the NAACP, became the center of black life and multiracial life in the area. And I won't get into all of this because I want to let um, uh, Jen Tilton share some mapping projects that relate to these same issues of black settlement patterns, civil rights and activism. So we'll go to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to share just a couple stories from the bridges that carried us over digital archive books, <laughs> um, which is an effort to document Black history in the IE that was begun by Wilma Amina Carter and Ratibu Jaycox, and really through their leadership over the last 15 years and the support of a huge community of volunteers, um, Bridges has now built a collection of 150 oral histories. You see a few names here, including Ron Kellum, who's in the room, and his mom. Um, but a lot of folks, um, and this is really just the very tip of the iceberg. Most of the resources are not yet um, live on the website. And so we're really um, interested in uh, partnering with you to find out what you want and getting you that before it's all processed and up there. Um, along with these um, oral histories, we've got a lot of photos and documents that together, you can go to the next slide, 
um, help us tell a rich set of stories um, of Black settlement and community building and civil rights struggles in the IE. We're slowly making these available at Cal State. Um, we've also got some social media sites that you can click through and explore where we're telling little bits of the story that you could bring into a classroom. And we're developing some story maps. You can click to the next slide that really package some of these primary sources into pieces that we hope that you can use in your classrooms or pull from. Um, uh, and I'm just going to share a tiny sample of a, one of these story maps today. And I want to begin, if you go to the next slide, with a short clip from an oral history by photographer Henry Hooks, who moved to San Bernardino's west side during World War II when he worked at Norton Air Force Base. You can play. Well, San Bernardino was an excellent place at the time. Yes. A few uh, people like me had uh, businesses. And since I was a southern boy from an area where we had everything of our own, <laughs> I felt the same Bernardina belonged to me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to now share my screen and um, share just a couple of actually the images that Henry Hooks has left with us. Um, he passed away just last year. Um, and some of the stories he's, he and other elders in this collection have helped us build to help us understand how the west side of San Bernardino, as one example, became a center of Black settlement. Um, here you see here one of his photos from the 1940s of the corner of 8th and Paris in San Bernardino. Um, when Henry Hooks moved to this neighborhood, he joined a small but growing and vibrant Black community that already had formed an NAACP. Um, a lot of folks had settled in this neighborhood to work at Santa Fe Rail Yard just down the street. Um, and by this point, you can see this two-story building here, which was um, like the, the building, in Riverside, building in Riverside. It was a um, commercial center that was founded by the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge and became a center of Black businesses in the community. And we're documenting and have some stories that we can share about those businesses. Um, in, uh, now, folks were, of course, moving to San Bernardino, moving to California, um, seeking uh, freedom, seeking economic opportunity, and particularly home ownership. But we kind of know California didn't always fully deliver on the dream. Um, and so this story map really um, uses some oral histories, but also some of these other documents and maps to begin to understand how housing segregation shaped San Bernardino. Um, we don't have redlining maps of the city. Um, and so we're piecing together the story out of these other primary documents. And I'll just show a couple um, things to you here. Um, you see here um, a pattern of Black settlement in San Bernardino in 1940, um, where Black folks have mostly settled in what was the Valley Truck Farm community south of the city. Um, and in this little area of the West Side um, below 9th Street. By 1960, that West Side Black community had really grown um, and expanded north. Um, and by 1970, in fact, the core of the West Side, kind of right here, became 70% Black. Um, and so this oral, this um, story map here is really um, an attempt to bring together these pieces of the archive, pieces, primary documents, to tell some of that story. Um, of how these racial um, barriers and boundaries and color lines were produced. Um, I'll walk you just through a couple of these. Um, first, we've collected a number of um, advertisements and home deeds that show the ways restrictive covenants helped to combine Black and Mexican families to very specific neighborhoods in the IE in the, from the 20s to the 40s. Here you see fairly common language. This is actually from Redlands um, of uh, how racial restrictions were written into deeds. And here, one of the more explicit um, advertisements of restricted covenants that was in the San Bernardino Sun in an ad in 1921, um, uh, explicitly saying this property is restricted to the right, white race. So obviously, ma by mapping some of these housing tracts that are advertised um, as re racially restricted, we see some of the ways um, that these signals to home buyers help to produce white segregated spaces in the IE. Um, of course, we also have newspaper clippings from the Black press that document episodes of white vigilante action that helped defend these color lines and produce these color lines. Um, white neighbors occasionally burned crosses or bombed cars and homes, um, most famously, of course, in Fontana, but also some cases in San Bernardino, uh, mapped here in Rialto. Um, and these stories were retold for years afterwards as warnings to um, Black families migrating to the region of where they should and should not move. Now, the beauty of the Bridges Archive, though, is that we have um, 
the stories from Black elders of the ways they experienced these color lines and the communities they built within them. Um, and so um, I'll just share, you know, really one of these stories. To, and you can look at this whole story map because the link is in the um, um, a lot of Black elders remember that when they first moved to San Bernardino in the 40s, Black folks couldn't move north of baseline, so here. Um, so most that's, again, why most people lived here. But as more folks came after World War II, partly working at the bases and being drawn by all those growing industries in the region, um, uh, those boundaries shifted um, and changed. And I'll let Lois Carson um, tell a little bit about um, her own move into 16th Street, north of that baseline. I moved on 16th Street and we integrated that street because I'm Catholic and I started going to St. Anthony Church there. So we saw a house for sale and it was close to the church. It seemed like a really good idea. So we uh, talked to the lady who was selling them. They were selling us the home. And the little kids next door told my kids the dogs didn't even like black people. <laughs> But we made it, I was the game friends with the neighbors, but it, it, in time, you know, it turned black. And, yeah. uh, I'll pause that there, um, in, but encourage you to listen to more of her story. Um, just a few years later and four blocks north, in fact, Dr. Um, Jean Peacock um, tells the story of how white flight and um, block busting had her neighborhood turned from all white to all black in just a few years. Um, and we also have stories uh, of more informal practice of real estate steering by landlords um, and real estate agents um, that also help to produce some of these boundaries and, and that kind of concentrated black settlement in the West Side. And I'll um, here just include a small clip of Jimmy Jews, who is San, uh, San Bernardino's first black firefighter, telling the story of when he and a white coworker went to go look for housing in the Del Rosa neighborhood in the 60s. I started trying to get a plot to go on the east side, the Del Rose area, that area. I walked up there and it had vacant space. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, we just killed that vacant space. Okay. So, my friend, after about the third one, he said, You've been talking. He went up there. Oh, yes, he got an opportunity. He said, Come on, dude. She saw me coming. She said, You know what? I just didn't know this. Um, so in because of time, I'm going to end there, um, but uh, the beauty of the Bridges Archive is that we have many more stories of, um, of Black elders and the kind of communities they built and the civil rights activism um, and fair housing activism um, that emerged out of the communities that they built in San Bernardino, Rialto, Redlands, uh, and Riverside. And we're excited to share some of those resources with you moving forward. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, who am I passing it to? Is it you on bottle? Yeah, it's me. So okay. um, <clears throat> we I apologize that we're running late. Uh, very quickly, you have this in your slides. We are we would love to create a teacher leader cohort that will be working with us to create <clears throat> lessons around many of the archives that you saw today and other resources. And we're inviting teachers to apply for this opportunity. Teachers will be paid at least $500 for their lesson once their lesson is fully complete and ready for publication. And it will be published <clears throat> at, at the UCLA website and also at some of the, the Citrus Park and some of the other places that we're gonna be uh, going around in the IE to learn. Danny, we can um, go to the next slide. So uh, if you're interested, we're going to put the, um, please, we're going to send out an invitation for that meeting next week. It'll be Thursday, 530, uh, 430 to 530. And here we go. And if you are interested and want to jump on this ahead of time, Here's uh, the form for the application form for you. If you have other colleagues you think would be interested but didn't get to come, please have them email me and we will share the information with them.
as well <clears throat> and send them a copy of uh, today's recording so that they can get an idea of what we're talking about. Please, we really wanted you to tell us that we could go back two slides, Danny, to slide 36. <clears throat> um, we know that some of you um, <clears throat> have a lot of ideas. So please tell us if there are some resources and materials that you would love to see in the lesson, if there are other sources that you would like us to think about it, looking for you. and. <clears throat> please sign in for us. And also, if you could please fill out our evaluation. We know that at the end we're rushing, but um, really, I mean, the stars are our historians who uh, shared um, these materials. <clears throat> if you look in your agenda, um, let me share your teacher agenda. You will see that the PowerPoint for today is included in there. I'm putting that link <sighs> right now. Um, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to our historians. A huge shout out uh, to you for coming. We know it's a late night. It's raining in Whittier, so the rain's coming, or if not, you guys sent it over. Thank you so much, Catherine, Michelle, Jen, and to Danny, he's sick, and Mark is always um, <clears throat> Thank you so much, and we will be sharing the video with you, and we'll let you know where it can be found. That teacher PowerPoint is for you. Please make sure you save it, a bookmark it, shortcut it on, in your drive so that you can have access to it. And we'll stick around for a couple of minutes if any of you have any questions, you need any other resources, so on and so on.